Good evening. Welcome to Western Avenue Baptist Church. Let me go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening, and we pray that during this week, uh, after Resurrection Sunday, that wherever the families and the kids are, that uh, you are with them, you are helping them to continue to grow. I pray that you are strengthening those parents to be uh, blessed examples of your son, Jesus Christ, uh, helping to raise them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. For here, we pray that you would continue to bless us and guide us by your Holy Spirit to receive the teaching of our brother Terry. As he goes through the book of Mark, help us to grow in our understanding of your will and purpose and in your son, Jesus Christ, that we may be continue to be conformed into his, his wonderful image. And Father, we give thanks to you for this evening. Pray them, name your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, we are still in Mark chapter 13. I think we will finish it up tonight. <clears throat> we need to start with a bit of a review just to get our bearings. We're still in day four of this final week. And day four started back in chapter 11, verse 27, with his confrontation with the religious leaders when they challenged him for his authority. And he told a, told a parable about them in twelve, how, chapter 12, how they misused their authority. And then he had interaction with the different aspects of the leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, um, Sadducees. In verse 38 of chapter 12, he begins teaching the people and he tells them to beware of the scribes, and the scribes are still standing right there. Um, and he shows that they're, they have a very shallow religion. It's, it, it's a really all about themselves. And they seem like they're pious people, but in reality, they take advantage of the poor. He contrasts that in 41 to 44 with the widow who uh, didn't give very much in, to the treasury, but it was all she had. So the people who gave a bunch of money but had a bunch of money left over ended up giving less proportionately. So she exercised the kind of faith that, he, that his disciples need to have, trust in God and dedication to God's program. In 13, he leaves the the uh, temple and moves over to the Mount of Olives and starts teaching there. So we have that transition in verses 1 to 4. As they're leaving the temple, the disciples are in awe of the grandeur of the temple complex. And Jesus says in verse 2, these things are not all that great. It's all going to be destroyed. It's a, it's a lesson in priorities. I got to thinking about that as I was looking over this today. <clears throat> Much of what Jesus says throughout, the, throughout this book when he's dealing with the uh, opposition, the Pharisees, etc., really has to do with priorities. Their priorities are really off. And he's trying to have his disciples get uh, correct priorities. So we have the same thing here. Don't focus on the temporal as good as it may look. <clears throat> so they ask him, uh, verses 3 and 4, uh, when are these things going to happen? So we have that question in verse 4, when will the end come and what signs will indicate its arrival? We looked at all this last time, so we'll go over this kind of quickly. He gives them signs of the end. So he answers their second question first. And there's a reason for that, which we'll get to. Verses 5 through 27. First he gives them 
some common occurrences. These are not signs of the imminence of the end. Verses 7 and 8 say that, you know, this is just the beginning of sorrows. This doesn't indicate the end yet. <clears throat> These are common experiences. They're going to go through. They're going to uh, experience all of these things. The false messiahs that come along, the wars, the plagues and the famines, even persecution. In Starting in verse uh, 14, he gets to what I have called here theological occurrences. These are signs of the imminence of the end. When you see these things happening, the end is right there. So it seems that in this discussion, he makes no distinction between things that are going to happen immediately and things that will happen later we can identify as the tribulation period. But we have that break in verse uh, 14. So 5 to 13 are things that his current, his disciples right there in front of him are likely to experience. 14 to 27 are things that are going to happen much later. And basically, it's increased um, tribulation. Verse 20 says that, um, well, verse 19 says that this is the worst tribulation that has existed since creation. And that's not anything that he described in verses 5 to 13. So this is more intense persecution. In verse 20, we have the cessation of that persecution. God ends the persecution in order to preserve his remnant. And remember, this is all about what Israel will experience. It doesn't talk about the rest of the world. So he cuts the days of tribulation short in order to preserve a remnant of Israel to build with after that's all over. In 21 to 23, there will be false messiahs coming along. They do a lot of miracles, but they don't get much done. 24 to 27, the real messiah shows up. And he gets things done. He regathers God's people from all around, all over the ends of the earth. No one's left out. <clears throat> and then, starting at verse 28, he gets to their first question, that is the time. When will this happen? And if we go back to that question they had in verse 4, he said, when will these things be fulfilled? That was the question of the disciples. And we discussed the word fulfilled when we talked about that passage. It means to be brought to a conclusion, to reach the end, the goal. So this is the wrapping up of all things. So he starts to answer that question in 28 to 37. He gives them a parable of the fig tree. Verse 28, now learn a parable from the fig tree. You see it put out leaves, you know the summer's right around the corner. In the same way, he says, when you see these things happening, verses 14 to 27, you know that the end is right there. We talked about verse 29. Uh, says, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near. We talked about the fact that there is no subject there as to what is near. It could be he, but it could be it. I don't think it's he, the Messiah, because he's already come in verses 24 to 27. This has to be the wrapping up of all things, which is the question they asked. When will all these things be fulfilled? Verses 30 and 31, he gives them some reassurance. Uh, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. We discuss that word generation. I take it to mean the people who are alive at the time these things are happening. <clears throat> In general, it could mean the whole Jewish race uh, will be saved through that remnant. Uh, and he gives them guarantee of that in verse 31. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, that is my teaching, everything I've told you so far about the end times, will not pass away. It's going to happen. You can count on it. Take it to the bank. 
Verse 32 has to be a big letdown. Well, before we get to 32, let's go to one alternate passage here. We won't take time to look it up, but in Matthew chapter 16, the first three verses, Jesus kind of chides the Pharisees because they were asking for a sign. And this is the same incident that we had in Mark chapter 8. After he feeds the 4,000, he goes to the west side of the Sea of Galilee and the Pharisees come out to confront him and they want a sign. And in Mark, he refuses to give them a sign. He said, why do you people always ask for a sign? <laughs> You're not going to get one. It wouldn't do any good anyway. They wouldn't, take, they wouldn't uh, take it to heart. But in Matthew 16, Matthew adds that he tells them, you are good at discerning the seasons, the, the weather signs, but you cannot discern the signs of the time. Again, it's a matter of focus. It's a matter of priority. Um, <clears throat> he uses the uh, what's the word? Not metaphor, figure of speech. It's an aphorism. That's what it is. A wise saying. To paraphrase in the way we usually hear it stated. Red sun at night, sailors delight. Red sun in the morning, sailors take warning. He says, you can read the weather and know what's coming, but you have no idea what's coming spiritually. Um, by the way, what does that saying mean? Red sun at night, sailors delight. Red sun in the morning, sailors take warning. It's atmospheric conditions. The sun comes up in the east, right? Last time I checked, which I think was this morning. And it goes down in the west. So if the, if the sunset is red, what does that indicate? What causes the redness? Dust in the atmosphere. Dust is dry. Okay. So our weather patterns come from west to east, except when the monsoons, <laughs> then they're reversed. But normal wind, wind patterns, at least in the northern hemisphere, it's opposite in the southern hemisphere. But in the northern hemisphere, the, the weather comes from the west to the east. So if you see a red sunset, you know that means the dry air is in the west, which means it's coming our way. So we're going to have fair weather. But if the red sun is in the morning, that means the dry weather has already passed. And we're in, in store for some wet weather given the weather cycles. Okay. So he says, you guys can figure that out. <laughs> you can figure out the weather by looking at the sky, but you can't figure out what God is doing by looking at the signs he gives you. Now, one little caveat here, and uh, it, we won't do it, but if you go to Matthew 16, 1 to 3, there's a marginal note that says most of verse 2 and all of verse 3 aren't, are not in the best manuscripts. So that may be something that was added later, but it's still apropos to the point because the Pharisees were focused on temporal things and not on eternal things. So they're good at those signs, but they're not good at the signs that really matter. It's again, priorities. So 332, he lets them down because they asked him when these things are going to happen. And he says, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So in answer to their question, when are these things going to happen? He has to say, I don't know. That's something the Father hasn't revealed. Some people might question what this has to say about Jesus' deity. If he's God, he's omniscient. He knows everything. So why would he not know this piece of information? Well, in his incarnation, he submitted himself to God's plan for redemption. He became human and was subject to human limitations. And throughout the Gospels, whenever anybody got upset with what he said 
or what he did. He always said, hey, I'm doing what the Father told me to do. I'm following his directions in all of this. I'm not doing this on my own. <clears throat> so this is a case. What, now, we know that he, is, he has demonstrated uh, divine power throughout the Gospels, healing people, casting out demons, seeing people when they weren't around him at their distance, knowing what's going on in people's minds, which we'll see in a little bit here, um, calming storms. So obviously, he exercised divine attributes. But within God's plan, in his submission as a human being, submitted to that plan, he wasn't necessarily aware of everything. Part of the limitation of the incarnation. It doesn't take away from his deity. In fact, notice he calls himself the Son. It's the only time in the book of Mark that he does that. Usually he calls himself the Son of Man, showing his identity with mankind. But this acknowledges his deity. He's acknowledging that he is God. But in this case, in his incarnation, he's limited to, uh, in some ways. In, in this case, he's, he's not aware of this information. God has not revealed it to him. It wasn't part of God's plan. So he has nothing to say to them when they want to know when. This is why he told them all of the signs first. You have the signs. You don't need to know the exact day and time. You have the signs. Watch the signs. They will tell you. And if you watch the signs and pay attention, when it does come, when the end does come, it won't take you by surprise. You may not know. You may not be able to set your watch. But you'll recognize it when it gets there. So he gives them all of those signs first because he knows he's not going to give them what they really want to know a day and time. <clears throat> so, new territory. Verse 33 to 37, his warning to be alert. He says in verse 33, take heed. That's the word to see or to watch. He's used it four times in this chapter verse 5, verse 9, verse 23, and now verse 33. Open your eyes, he's saying. Watch. Keep on the alert. This is a different word. It's a compound word. It's a combination of the verb to hunt and the noun sleep. So it describes someone who is hunting for sleep. If you are hunting for sleep, what are you not? You're not asleep because <laughs> you're hunting for sleep. So it came to mean being awake, being alert, even restless. Okay, so he's telling them, wake up, be alert. Keep on the alert. For you do not know when the appointed time is. We discussed last time, if we did know the day and time, how would that affect our a response to what God has for us to do. Now, most people are, have a tendency to be lazy. We want to take the easy way out. It's a human tendency. <clears throat> if we knew that this wasn't going to happen for another 10 years, we might say, oh, well, <laughs> I've got time. You know, I, I, I don't really have to be busy doing things. But since you don't know when it's going to happen, you'd better be busy getting things done that God wants you to do. That's why it's hidden. In verse 34, he gives them a parable. And, and uh, I have on the, the board up there Luke chapter, uh, chapter 19. It's not parallel to this, but it's the same kind of story, and it's in more detail. He says, it's like a man away on a journey who upon leaving his house and putting the slaves in charge, assigning to each one his task, also commanded the doorkeeper to stay on the alert. This is a different word, to stay on the alert. This is the one word in Greek, Gregoreo, we get our name Gregory from this. It means uh, rousing oneself from sleep and being alert. So it's like, wake up. 
would be a modern paraphrase for that. So he commanded the slaves and the doorkeeper to wake up, (laughs) be alert. Why? Verse 36, I'm sorry, sorry, 35. Therefore be on the alert, the same word, wake up, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, at cock crowing, or in the morning. You need to be alert, you need to be awake because you don't know when the end is coming. And you don't want to be caught sleeping, which he says in verse 36. Be alert lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. That's the last thing God, anyone should want for God to keep him, keep, to catch him sleeping. Um, <clears throat> I like the way Luke's, gospel, Luke's account of this parable has it in verses 11 and 27. We won't read the whole thing, but it's more detailed. That, you know, he gives this slave this much money, this slave this much money. And he tells them, occupy, in the King James, occupy until I come. The New American Standard translates it, do business until I come. This is our job. Between the time Christ died and the time he returns, we all have a job to do. He's given each of us a job to do. And we need to be doing that job until he returns. I guess the question is, what job? (laughs) What job has God given us? Well, that's an individual thing. If we go back to chapter 8, just after Peter rebuked him for saying he was going to die and then Jesus goes into this discussion of what it takes to be a disciple. If anybody wants to follow me, you have to put your own interests aside and follow God's interests. That's basically discipleship. Take up your cross and follow me. Your cross is the job God has given you to do because you have to sacrifice your desires in order to do that job. So God has given each of us a job to do. It's our responsibility to find out what that job is and get busy doing it. This comes into the area of spiritual gifts. God has gifted all of his children with at least one gift, a divine ability to do something and to do it well, perhaps to do it better than anybody else can do it. And it's our job to find out what that is and then to get busy doing it. And that's what the church is for. The church exists to give Christians a context for exercising their spiritual gift for the maturity of the whole body. Ephesians chapter four, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So for an application here, we each have to ask ourselves, what is my gift? (laughs) Or what are my gifts? And what should I be doing? If you're not sure, Get busy doing something. You know, you can't steer a parked car. If you want God to lead you, get moving so he can steer you where he wants you to be. It reminds me of of, uh, a real life story at a church I attended um, years ago. They were dealing with this issue and the person was recounting this because they had gone through this experience. There was a a guy probably in his 20s who was, uh, he had some learning difficulties. So he wasn't quite proficient at a lot of things. But he really wanted to be involved doing something. And uh, especially with the, the elementary age Sunday school. He really had an affinity for that level. Maybe because of his learning difficulties, I don't know. but. He really wanted to be involved. So the church did a very wise thing. They put him to work. Well, why don't you try being a monitor? While Sunday school is going on, you walk around and you keep your eye on things. And Well, that didn't work too well. He didn't have much of a focus because of his difficulties. So they said, well, why don't you try this? And he tried that, it didn't work. Why don't you try teaching? He didn't have what it took to teach. They tried a half a dozen things, and finally they said, why don't you try being secretary, Sunday school secretary? That was it. (laughs) 
he had a mind for details. And he knew the name of every kid in the Sunday school. He knew their attendance records. He knew their families, their siblings, their parents, their names, and all of that stuff. He had a Rolodex in his head. So he found where he belonged, but only because he got busy. And the church was wise enough to, to let him try. Now, there are going to be some failures when, when you do that. But we're not after perfection. We're after involvement. And involvement will eventually get a person where he needs to be. Involvement glorifies God. Right. Occupy till I come. <laughs> yeah. So, if you're not aware of your spiritual gift yet, <laughs> that's your first step. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, if you want some hints on how you might go about that, I'm sure pastor would be willing to talk with you. I'd be willing to talk with you. But that's what church is about. Finding it, your it does not involve going online and taking a questionnaire. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it involves getting involved. You know, doing, I'll give you a little preliminary hint. Uh, often you can tell what your spiritual gift is or the kind category of gift by looking at what you are motivated to do. What is it that you really have a heart for? Chances are your spiritual gift is consistent with that. Um, So, the parable here, Jesus is gone, he is coming back, and so you want to be alert doing what he's given you to do so that when he comes back, he will find you active and not asleep. As Mark told them earlier, it's the one who is faithful to the end, who is rewarded. The one who flakes off, you know, he's not going to get a reward. And that again is the whole point of the book of Hebrews from a little bit different perspective, but it's the same principle. So, um, enough soapboxing. On 35, we have some technical stuff here. It says, be on the alert, for you do not know uh, when the master of the house is coming, whether in the evening, at midnight, at cock crowing, or in the morning. These are the four watches of the night for Romans. The Jews had three. So the Romans had four. Uh, so evening is 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Midnight is 9 to 12, and these are defined by the end of the period. Cock crowing is 12 to 3, and in the morning is 3 to 6. So he's writing to his Romans and saying, whatever God's given you to do, you have to do it. Because <laughs> you don't know. He may come back at any time. So be alert, be on guard. Do what you should be doing so that when he comes back, he will not find you asleep, but will find you actively involved in in the task he's given you to do. And then he wraps that up in verse 37. And what I say to you, I say to all, be on the alert. That's that same word again, wake up. Now, the question here is, who are the all? He says, what I say to you, the you would be the disciples who are sitting there listening to it. But who are the all? No one else is there listening. (laughs) Probably it refers to the people who will hear all of this through these disciples. When they write their gospels and they teach their disciples, they will repeat this. And it will be carried on through the ages. So everyone up to the time when verse 14 starts, they're the all. All people throughout the ages, well, all believers throughout the ages, will hear, will hear this warning and should uh, take it to heart. Do what it says. It's similar to what, uh, what he said in John 17. He prayed for his current disciples And then he turns and prays for the disciples who will become disciples through his disciple testimony. 
if that makes sense. So he's looking to the future disciples. Uh, related to that, the ongoing teaching of all of this, uh, an issue you may come across is that there are many people who say that the Bible we have today is corrupt, and so you can't trust it. It's different from what they had in the first century. There are three groups primarily that we're familiar with that make this claim. Mormon, the Mormon Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and Christian Science. They all base their doctrine on the idea that you can't trust the Bible. And they all make the same claim. They have the original. At the end of the first century, the original disappeared. And so our Bibles are based on the false stuff that came after that. And they somehow have gotten the original. There's several problems with that. First of all, if you look at what each of them, each of their scriptures, they don't match. So they can't all be right. Plus, there is documentary and historical evidence that shows there never was a break. The original disciples taught their disciples at the end of the first century, and those disciples became the early church fathers at the beginning of the second century, and they taught the same thing to their disciples who became the early church fathers at the end of the second century and into the third century, and they taught their disciples the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. So there was no great apostasy, as the Mormons put it. There was no break in the, in the, the text. We have a continuous text, so we can rely on, on our Bibles. Yeah, I would say all three <laughs> rely on what I call historical revisionism, where they're going back and revising history, but if you do understand church history, you'll see some severe flaws and discrepancies between what they say and what we have from history. The other thing, too, just as an example, Mormons as well as Jehovah's Witnesses have histories, problematic histories in their own formation, um, false prophets, um, positions that should not have been taken if they truly did have a direct line to God, which they claim to have. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, many false prophecies about when the end times were coming. Uh, Mormons claim to always have a prophet and 12 apostles, um, or, or something like that, or an apostle and 12 prophets, sorry. And uh, if that's the case, they shouldn't be making the mistakes that they've made in their history. So a lot of issues, in addition to the fact that they're just off from history, they're off from, from the uh, original church fathers, and in the case of Mormons, they've thrown on extra books which do not cohere with all of Scripture. Right. So in addition to all those problems, they all make the same claim that the original message was lost and they found it. But they all have the same problem. They don't give any evidence. They don't back it up with facts. They make up their own Scriptures. They... Basically, those three groups especially started with the King James Bible back in the 1800s and just rewrote it to match the theology that they developed on their own. Um, so be alert, because you're going to come up on things like that, people who try to twist, um, twist the truth. And, and I have seen cases where I've pointed out to Jehovah's Witnesses where their theology is off from the scriptures, and then they'll say, oh, well, those verses have been corrupted. Yeah. It's a circular argument. You ask them to prove it, they can't prove it. They just know that's the way it is. Yeah. Okay, we've got a few minutes left here, so... We'll get into chapter 14. This is the end of this section on uh, instruction and conflicts. We've seen the conflicts he's had with the various uh, Jewish leaders. <clears throat> We've seen the instruction that he's given his disciples. So chapters, uh, chapter 11, verse 12 through chapter 14, verse 2 is all that section on instruction and conflicts. So here's the last one. 
the Sanhedrin hatches a plot to kill him. The first two verses of chapter 14. <clears throat> now the Passover and unleavened bread was two days off. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and kill him. The word stealth there is a word that means bait or a snare, like the bait that you put in a trap to catch somebody. And it came to mean deceit or guile. Here it's stealth. We want to do this secretly. We want to fool people. Why? Verse 2, for they were saying, not during the festival, lest there be a riot of the people. We saw the same thing back in chapter 11 when they got upset with him for cleansing the temple and they wanted to, get, to take him then and they said, no, I can't do it because we got people all around us who think he's a prophet. So if we make a move on him now, we're going to be in trouble. Well, they have the same problem, even though this is you know, later on. So they want to take him secretly, not at the time of the festival. Verse 3, we start with day 5. And this is preparation for Jesus' death. So the conflict so far, well, the conflict that has been going on, um, ceases, at least for the moment. And now he's dealing with his disciples. It says in verse 3, well, let me get this up on the slide there. First of all, we, has, we have his being anointed at Bethany. Verse 3, and while he was in Bethany, remember, they spent their nights in Bethany. The days were in Jerusalem. It's two miles away. So they'd walk to Jerusalem every morning, and every evening they walked back, back to Bethany. Now, presumably, presumably, yeah, they left from the Garden of Gethsemane where he's given them all this teaching on the end and took the road north to around the Mount of Olives to Bethany. So he's at the house of Simon the leper. <clears throat> this is interesting. This is significant. It's again about priorities. So verse 3 is a setting. I just read it. Well, part of it. It goes on. He's at the house of Simon the leper and reclining at table. At the table. That means they are eating a meal. There came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume, a pure nard, uh, which comes from, I think, India. So to get it all the way from India to Israel, it was expensive stuff. And it hasn't been watered down. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But notice the, he's eating at the, uh, a leper's house. Now this person didn't necessarily have leprosy at this time. He could have had it in the past and been healed. But this is how people identified him. Simon the leper. We talked about this back in chapter 2. Jesus healed a leper, and the leper, well, he told the leper, go to the priest, show yourself to the priest, make the appropriate sacrifices so you can be declared clean and you can re-enter society. And we reviewed the law about leprosy. The quarantine was a big deal. because this And leprosy meant any kind of skin problem, not, not just what we think of as leprosy. If it's contagious, you know, you, you don't want to go around any, anybody. So they had to isolate themselves. And it says there in the law, if you come in contact with a leper, you have to do the same thing. You have to take a bath. You have to wash your clothes. You have to go to the temple and make all these sacrifices to be declared clean. And if you enter a leper's house and, and don't realize it until it's too late, you're already in there, same thing. You get out of there as fast as you can and you go through all of these cleansing rituals to be sure you don't spread the disease. So lepers were outcasts. And you don't want to go anywhere near a leper. 
He's in the house of a leper <laughs> eating dinner. What would the Pharisees say about that? Well, we'll see what they would say a little later in a different situation. <clears throat> we saw the, the uh, emphasis of the, cere- of the uh, Pharisees about being ceremonially unclean in chapter 7. They were complaining that the disciples ate without having first washed their hands the way the Pharisees thought they should wash their hands. Dirt. It was a ceremony for spiritual cleansing. And Jesus said, that's irrelevant. That's not going to defile you before God. The food is the food, and it doesn't even get into your body. How can it get into your soul and defile you before God? And Luke 7, we have the same kind of thing going on, 36 to 50. They're all worried about defilement. Um, so this is almost a slap in the face of, of the Pharisees. He's breaking the rules. Jesus did that a lot. Uh, but purposely to wake them up to the fact that their rules were superficial. They weren't God's rules. And he makes that very clear there in chapter 7. He says, you do a fine job of setting aside God's law to practice your own traditions. <clears throat> well, we're out of time. So we'll have to go on. We'll talk about that anointing that happens in verse 3. We already read it, but we'll get into some details next time. Any observations, comments about any of that? Just to, just to add on top what you were talking about, Jesus breaking their rules. He was perfect under God's law, um, but he broke their rules. And Mark chapter 7 gives a perfect contrast of how they elevated the traditions of the elders to be equal to the scriptures of God. Right. Priorities. <laughs> okay, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Again, Father, we thank you for your sovereignty, that things are going according to your plan. Even though we may think that things are falling apart, um, everything fits together as you desire it to be. We pray that you'll enable us to see our part in your plan and carry it out as we should. In Jesus' name, amen.